Hi, this is the second part to a much longer reaction. If you haven't seen it yet, links to it are in the description as well as the top corner of the video. Now with all that out of the way, let's continue with this then, shall we? It's been so awesome though, right? It would be cool. That aside, the only other name changes course, I can yes, mention sorry. are in the chapter 2 demo, that being a big lack thereof. The chapter select just has the window name set to Deltarune chapter 1 and 2, and then to just Deltarune chapter 2 when you're playing, well, chapter 2. There's nothing else I've known in regards to that. Mm -hmm. The next thing I'd like to go over is... The user interface. I'm not joking. In the Undertale 6th anniversary stream, Toby called attention to the different UIs between the light and dark worlds, mainly in this comment of his. This was upsetting. If you notice the menu that comes up here when she asks at the end of the scene is the Undertale choice menu. After you come back from the Dark World it's the Dark World menu. I was really trying hard to make it seem like Undertale. To the point where I made two different menu systems. It's so subtle no one will really care but yet. Yeah. Well, the I beginning trust, of this game is all about the first impressions. I really wanted people think it was potentially Undertale. So I put so much effort into making Undertale looking world. That goes down to the menus and the characters. Emphasis on yeah. the menus. While I'm sure that part of the reason for the major differences in the UI between worlds is to do with subverting expectations as I believe the intention for survey program especially was to just leave people wondering just what they were in for and having expectations thrown out the window, I feel some confidence as well in the idea that the UI changes may actually hold some relevance for Deltarune's meta narrative. so let's go over it real quick. In the light world, as Toby mentioned, the UI is meant to be as identical to Undertale's UI as possible. Yeah, basically, same design, yeah. Same menus, even the same appearance for the dialogue choices in the beginning of the chapter when Susie asks Chris how they feel about just Chris doing the project before cutting them off. This, of course, changes later on to be more like how the Dark World handles dialogue choices, but it goes to show how Toby was very dedicated in making people think this was more of something that they were familiar with. Mm -hmm. The only other real differences between this UI and Undertale's is the arrangement, like the box that shows your basic info is at the bottom and not the top left. The currency is now money instead of gold, and Chris has $2 at the start of the game, and some interesting things in the stats. Where in Undertale, Chris yeah. started with a stick and bandage, it had 0 attack or defense at level 1, Chris is at the same level and has 10 attack and 10 defense, and also has a pencil instead of a stick. Which also, I mean, I, there is also the whole thing where it's like, there is, you know, the brat. actually, wait a second, yeah, that is something I never connected before, yeah. Granted, as I've said before, it's been a long time since I played Undertale, so I don't exactly remember that, but... Yeah, Chris actually starts with some attack and defense. That's weird. And then looking at the Dark World stats, they have 10 attack, but 2 defense? And on top of that, in the Light World, if it was following Undertale, then they should have only 10 attack at level 6, and the maximum defense you can have, not accounting for armor, is 4. Man, I might have to make a separate video on this. Again, wait, I'm just uh, doing like a side tangent on this. They, Molly keeps talking about having to do other videos and they must be working absolutely nuts because on their channel, they have like, they have one like a backrooms video. They have the two uh, uh, device theory videos. They have one uh, staring winds, the Deltarune ARG you didn't play. Oh God, oh no. I'm gonna have to look at that, aren't I? And then there's, you know, a 10,000 cases a subs a subscriber special video. So, oh God, I'm definitely, you know, I'm just gonna subscribe. I I'm definitely gonna have to wa watch all this later. Oh no. It looks like I'm not alone in me having weird questions about the stats either, as there is a lot of weird stuff surrounding them in this game, particularly in the way it differentiates between love and level. Oh, okay. Okay, so now level actually is its own thing, but huh? Actually, maybe that might have something to do with the fact that like Chris goes up a level between chapters like in chapter one Chris if you don't play if you play like completely passively is level one and in chapter two they're level two. I wonder if that- I wonder if that's, like, purely, like, just for, like, balancing? Like, as the game will get more difficult as it goes on? Or if there's an actual, like, reason, like, or if there's an actual, like, story reason behind that? 
Thoughts. Love, uh, love is completely static so far, and level is displayed rather inconsistently. The only somewhat reliable measure of it being when you check your party's uh, party member stats in the dark world uh, at save points. The it only actual dis it only actually displays the uh, the chapter you're on, and it on the config file it doesn't seem to change at all. And your level only seems to change during a chapter after you've sealed a fountain, like in this screenshot. Oh. Okay. So, oh, geez, I, you know, I just thought maybe that's, maybe, that, maybe Chris isn't actually the knight. Maybe, in fact, Chris is just grinding, just repeatedly creating and destroying fountains. Just that you gotta, you gotta get that level grind going on. On top of that, since I don't mention it when talking about the weird route in chapter two, there are also a F ton of, of flags that more closely track how many times you've frozen enemies, spared enemies, pacified them, lost them, etc. And it definitely looks like Toby is keeping a closer eye on your individual actions in regards to how you treat other darkeners compared to a more uh, straightforward kill mercy system like in Undertale. Essentially, I don't think this game's focus combat wise is on how strong you get from violence and hurting others, but rather how willing you are to break bonds with others and forego friendship. And that being your way of getting stronger in Deltarune. If you want a more in-depth look at it, since this delves more into the sheer technical side of it and not just from the perspective of the meta narrative, as I will probably say plenty of times in the series, Half Red Chaos has a very good video on this for the sake of the series though. Um, I don't go too in-depth into the specifics, but the weird route in general is something I'm definitely going to bring up later in part two. Okay. And Half Red Chaos, another name I've been asked to, re uh, to react to. But back on topic. The most notable thing is that the name here is specifically Chris rather than the player name. And in fact, it stays like yeah. this in the light world in both chapters. Your name is never brought up in the light world once. However, I believe this is all I can really say about the light world's UI for the time being. And also, there is one thing I actually did not know until after initially finishing this audio, which is really baffling. Oh, there is a variable that tracks how many characters are in the player's name in the light world. I want you to sit and think about how fucking weird that might be. The player's name in the light world has always been Chris. It never changes to our name, and we only play as Chris. And furthermore, there's more code that implies that if the player's name in the light world is seven or more characters long, then it should change to just question marks. Once again, thanks to Halfred for this, as I probably either never saw this, or I just never stopped to give it some proper thought. Oh god, I am... I am terrified... Oh god, okay, I am terrified thinking about how... how what could that be about? Oh no, what? Seven or more left? S T. E-R. I guess there's only six. The only reason why you would need this code would be to imply that at some point in the future, our soul is not going to be controlling Chris, but someone else. This could be December, this could be, I don't know, Papyrus, I don't, I don't know, just any character whose name is seven or more letters long. I'm not even sure what to say about this, honestly. This definitely is something I'll have to touch on later, but goddamn. The implications oh. of that alone open a lot of possibilities for how things in the light world could go in the future. Moving on to the- Oh, that is- that is weird. Because of course we've seen, you know, a couple of times at this point, Chris literally ripping out their soul, and they specifically lock it away either in the cage or they stuff it into the couch or like a cabinet where it can't escape because we still control it. It's like in the Undertale like battles where the heart moves around. So like what happens if that soul touches like a different character? We we could potentially gain control of them. Oh. 
Oh, if that happens, I want- I definitely see what's going on there. Oh, wow. Dark World's UI, the whole aesthetic of it is completely different. More finely detailed than the Light World's UI, the presentation being a lot more smooth compared to how abrupt it is in the Light World, more options to pick from, even being the only UI of the two to have configuration options. <laughs> this also gives a more in-depth look into stats, what items you have, and other things to accommodate for the game giving you control over up to three party members at a time. Overall, where the Light World is more familiar in its presentation, I think the Dark World's UI helps get across the idea that the Dark Worlds are the meat of Deltarune. This is mm -hmm. where all the real gameplay happens, and it's where most of your playtime will probably go. But Obviously, it's the yeah. attention to detail in that between worlds, the user interface is so drastically different to accommodate for what is pretty much two completely separate playstyles. I'll come back to this when I get to my theory proper. Moving on, when Chris first finds themselves in the cliffs, you can already take notice of a few very important things. First, in your items, the only thing Chris has is their cell phone. They could use this in the light world to call Toriel at first, but here... Yeah, gaster, uh, gaster garbage. A very familiar sound plays instead. Smell yep. that OGG. The description of this noise is different between chapters, and the first one it's just said that it doesn't seem to be working, and in chapter 2 it's specified to just be garbage noise. And the other thing to take note of happens when you first encounter a save point. Interacting with one for the first time shows that the save slot is under Chris's name. Location is left blank, they are at level 1, and the time is at 0 minutes, 0 seconds. When you save, Chris's name is now overridden with your name taking its place, some question marks for the location and the amount of time you've been playing so far. From here on, in Chapter 1, you are able to interact with these save points and override your current save as such, similarly to how you did it in Undertale. And this leads smoothly into a discussion of another part of the user interface, the save menu. Everyone's seen this screen before. You yeah. may only see it after completing either chapter so far, and the standout thing about this game's approach to saving compared to Undertale is the appearance of three save slots rather than just Undertale's just one. one slot. Your options are also more varied, being able to change the language, being able to copy and erase save files, and depending on what demo you're playing, either going to the chapter select screen or just quitting the game altogether. What people may also know, but probably not as much, is what happens when you try to access this menu before you have completed chapter 1. No background, all the text and boxes are green as if you're running it on a much older computer. The same droning from the beginning of the game is playing rather than before the right, story, yeah. and instead of the normal narration that the game provides you, it's none other than Gaster commenting on what you're doing, being his completely normal and hinged self and offering very analytical remarks on what you do. Referring to copying files as reflections, going back on erasing files as sparing them, referring to empty files as barren, and speaking in past tense at some points for whatever reason, finding your behavior very interesting depending on what you do, his usual whole ominous shtick. His dialogue here honestly has a lot to unpack as his vocabulary regarding the save files gives them this lifelike nature in a sort of unsettling way. Mm -hmm. Copying files, he describes it as a division if onto an empty file, and warning that the file will be subsumed or absorbed if you're copying onto an already occupied slot, describing them as shapes and the such. And if you copy one save slot onto the other two so that all of them are the same file, he says preparations are complete, which is incredibly odd. It's not really describing what? it in a way that save menus normally describe this kind of stuff. It feels vaguely like the decisions you make in this version of the menu carry more impact than simply copying or erasing stuff. And this is the only time you can ever see this menu. Chapter 2 doesn't even have this presentation to the save select as, before you complete it, it has the same narration as it would after completing the chapter, but just a different background and music. But there's another thing about this version of the save menu that is exclusive to it. Credit to half Bread Chaos's video for this as I just find it fucking baffling. Looking in the code for this menu, there is a variable that is simply just called threat. What the hell is a variable with that name doing in a save select menu, you might be wondering. As Halfbred explains it, and after experimenting with it myself, this variable is a number that starts at zero but goes up by one every time you reach this specific prompt when you attempt to erase a save file, and the game hits you with the are you really sure. It doesn't go up if you delete the save file, it just goes up by one if you get to this prompt at all, so you can spare it and it'll have the same effect. But when this number gets up to 10 and you back out of this prompt, the variable resets and Gaster just says, very interesting. This is the only time you can get this specific line out of him. Why the hell is the game tracking something so specific as how many times you might have backed out of deleting a save file last second? Let alone in one of the least seen versions of this menu, and why does Gaster comment on it? I, I don't think I ever saw this. 
And thinking back, yeah, I don't think I ever saw this because when I originally played the demo, like I think I literally played it almost in one sitting. So I never had to save and quit out of the game and then load the save again. Once again, I'd like to get to this right now, but we still have plenty to lay out before I can start going completely off the shits. To circle back around, you might notice that an empty save slot is marked as such, with no time or location specified and the word empty in brackets. This is about what you'd expect, but remember when you first overwrote a save file and it showed Chris's name instead of yours? Yeah. Let's go back on another new slot and... <laughs> it just shows the word empty in brackets. Zero minutes, zero seconds, and instead of level one, you're at level zero. It's completely blank. Even if you were to delete your first save file and play the game again, you are met with this at your first save point. Chris's save slot is not just something you overwrite every time you play chapter one again. Once you overwrite it that one time, it's that's gone it. gone forever. Nothing short of pretty much uninstalling the game, wiping all of your data of the game completely, and reinstalling as if you've literally never played it before, will show Chris's save slot again, at least in the dark world. Or at least, that's what I initially thought. I also forgot to mention, but the same applies to Chapter 2. If you just start oh, really? a blank slot there, as if playing it for the first time ever, once you reach your first save point, you'll once again see Chris's name on the save slot and on all three of the slots you can pick from in this menu. The only notable difference here is that now it specifies that Chris is in Castletown and is counting up from when you started playing Chapter 2, but otherwise these three slots with Chris's name are all blank as usual, so this is probably just specifying where Chris is right now. And, just like Chapter 1, after you save for the first time, you never see this again, as saving from this point forward just shows new file in every empty slot instead. At least, as long as you have this specific file appear in your data for Deltarune on top of the save files you already have. dr.ini. This is the configuration file for all of your save data in Deltarune across all chapters, including completion saves. As you can tell, it displays all unused save slots as empty. And as a test, I removed this file as well as every save file from Deltarune's folder and started chapters 1 and 2 completely clean. And would you look at that? Chris's name appears yet again, only just this once in both chapters. So that's all you really need to do to see this for yourself. Although, even despite removing all these files, the save menu still displays your unused slots as empty. On one hand, this makes sense. The game on a technical level has code for specifically writing empty or blank save slots, and those empty slots are what you see on the save select. They're just transferred from the configuration file, so I imagine maybe the game could only pull off the Chris save slot thing once, or else it would have to basically write Chris on every empty save slot, which <laughs> wouldn't make as much sense to the player, plus it would be a little bit on the nose from a meta standpoint. Yeah, I'd even go as far as to be. say that perhaps seeing Chris's name in all three slots here in Chapter 2 could have been an unintended byproduct of this design choice, because at that point the configuration file wouldn't have been made yet, so it's still working on the very initial process of you playing this game, or chapter, for the very first time. Yeah, so now I'm trying to figure out whether this would be- whether this is done intentionally or just a glitch. I mean, many of the best features were started out as a glitch, so you never know. But on the other hand, this one action, this one overwriting of the save slot where even playing the game on another empty slot won't show Chris's name again, I think really sheds light on how this game has been referred to as a connection. It's like in doing this, the connection has been officially struck, your mark on Chris cannot be undone now. In fact, that's the thing about this configuration file that I think needs to be nailed in. Chris's save file only really appears when there is no evidence whatsoever that you've had any trace of playing this game before. Effectively, it is a placeholder. Something that, if you've gone deep enough into the rabbit hole of how Delta Rune handles placeholders, does check out as it's gotten plenty of documentation for doing really weird shit with them specifically. And so, uh -huh. the act of erasing save files, I feel, is now brought into question. Technically, you're not deleting anything, so to speak. I mean, you are, but erasing a save file in this case only just sets these values to empty as the configuration file is specified to do so. It's not the same as having Chris's save file because that would have existed before you came into the picture. Your file, your slots, were created in the Goner Maker. And so what you're really doing is overwriting Chris's save, and erasing it from that point forward doesn't matter because that is still something that you are in control of, not them. There is no going back from striking this connection. Am I implying that not only the save system in Deltarune, but also the very concept of empty save slots and how a game makes them is now diegetic to it? I... I guess I am. Oh, and I haven't even gotten that deep in speculation yet. Oh, like, no. we thought Undertale having its save mechanic be diegetic was crazy. Now I'm out here telling you that Deltarune's save menu is diegetic? Diegetic save menu. 
What's it? Are there any other games that have something like that? I'm trying to think. I mean, uh, I can't really think of any that have diegetic save menus. I mean, the closest I can think of would be like the Resident Evil games, the earlier ones where you type, where, you, where the saves are like you typing on a typewriter. Oh god. And this, man, I know I've been talking about so... this for quite a bit already, and this is after already having finished part one's audio, but some new information has come to light thanks to other theorists talking a bit more about the specific aspect of the save system that I think I should acknowledge while I am on the topic of it. Oh for really? To touch back on this point, where whenever you play Chapter 2 with no already existing data, Chris's name shows up on all three slots before you overwrite one of them and they all turn back to being new files. The big question is, does this mean that Chris has three save slots? Maybe. Very big maybe. Maybe with a yeah. capital M and a trademark. We don't know enough specifics about how saving works in this world, or how it will manifest in the plot properly to be certain one way or another in my opinion. Though, I personally don't believe that this is the case, and I do think this is just an unintended product of the way the meta-narrative is trying to present itself. Okay, and let yeah. me explain why. I think that Chris having three save files, assuming that they have not been to a Dark World before, or even if they have been to one, does not line up with the way the meta-narrative has unfolded so far. The light world, functionally, is meant to be closer to how Undertale operates. The UI is similar, the stats are near identical, the first dialogue prompt in the light world is meant to be identical to it. The only thing we don't know is whether saving actually exists in the light world. Although I do personally think that it is a possibility, but if so, then it functions more like Undertale in that it only saves to one slot and doesn't give you a choice between the three, at least with what we are given at the moment. This is really specific, but in Chapter 1, when you put a save point in the Light World, the UI for saving actually comes up and it's identical to Undertale in appearance. But in Chapter 2, when you do the same thing in the Light World, it does pop up the UI for saving to all three slots, but not a Light World equivalent to it. So therefore you get what you're seeing now, where the UI is not to scale with the Light World and is going off screen. Plus, it's using oh, the Dark okay. World border and not the Light World border. And as I mentioned, I do think that the idea of Chris's name being on all three slots is something that the game tends to avoid, as the normal save menus make an effort to name all blank slots as empty even when there is no configuration file or save data of yours present. If it didn't do this, and Chris showed up on all three slots, it would be pretty on the nose, and most importantly, it probably would not make sense to imply that Chris has three save slots when they have, for the most part, lived in a world with logic that mostly matches one where everyone would only have one save slot. And I mean, let's those who Chris have access been to, to it, but yeah. Before, right? The big issue I have with the idea of them already having saved in Chapter 1, or between chapters, or at all, is that if that were the case, there would be a consistency between a clean Chapter 2 file and a transferred one. That being, this little bit of text in the Light World's UI when you transfer your Chapter 1 save into Chapter 2. Since Chapter 1. While the variable that checks for this is a little bit weird, we can at least gauge that this text verifies that the save file was last overridden in Chapter 1. If Chris really did save in between chapters, or in Chapter 1 on their own, I feel like there would have been at least some indicator of this, and yet, I don't feel so confident in that. The only thing that even changes in Chapter 2's version of Chris's save slot is that their level is now 2 instead of 1. This would confirm that they at least sealed the first fountain with their soul, but the thing is, I don't think they really saved, because not only does this text not show up on a blank Chapter 2 save, but the timer also is a dead giveaway to me. We can at least assume Chris's supposed save file, or their soul, was meet when they came into existence, obviously. But since they themselves have never saved before, their save file always shows 0 minutes and 0 seconds. If they saved in Chapter 1, or before that point at all meta-wise, it should show some indication of time, some amount of minutes and seconds that passed since their creation. I at least can believe that our time always starts at zero from a blank slot because that is our slot being created and overriding Chris's. In any other case where the player is not involved, it would instead be Chris themselves overriding their own slot. But if this is to tell me anything, it's that they don't do that. I'd be willing to believe that maybe later they get access to three save slots as Castle Town expands and they get access to more features, but with the way these files are presented, I feel like it's not truly intentional. Why would yeah. Chris, who has never saved before, have access to three slots only for the overwriting of one of them by the player to overwrite all, all of, them? of them? It made sense in Chapter 1 because at least there you only saw one slot at a time that you overwrote. 
And I feel like with how Chapter 2 presents its safe system, it seems to be a byproduct of having sealed a fountain or otherwise expanding Castletown. Beyond the menus which exist outside of the core game, this is implied to be an ability that was only gained in Chapter 2 onwards. If Chris had three save slots before, why wouldn't they have been able to save the any of those three slots before Chapter 2? Chapter 1 and 2's save systems are deliberately different, and Toby never updated the former to be more like the latter, and I feel like that has to be on purpose for whatever reason. And I think if Toby were to do anything now to change how Chapter 2 or 1 handle their save systems, it would give away more than he's probably comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I think right now this is just something that I can't confidently answer, but I'd like to see how future chapters handle the concept of transferring your previous files versus playing on a completely fresh file. There has to be something yeah, to it, but with what Chapter 2 adds on to this, I just think it's way too up in the air right now for me to be certain that it says anything about Chris's experience with saving, or about how saving works on a meta-narrative level. Maybe the answer lies somewhere in the fact that completion files are generated in the game, and those seem to differ from the normal save files? I don't know, that's really my only guess, but otherwise yeah. I got nothing. I don't think any interpretation yes, yeah. is wrong because we really don't know, but if my view of the meta narrative is to be true, then I think some of these details are honestly unintentional byproducts of the way the game is presenting certain details to the player on a meta level. Because ultimately, the real question that I can't help but ask is, if Chris has three save slots, why do they need the player at all? The save yeah. menu outside of the core game makes an effort to mark all of your blank slots as empty because this is what the player has access to. This is what was made for them. Wouldn't Chris having three slots be redundant on top of being inconsistent with how the Light World's mechanics have been portrayed so far? And severely complicate an already rather complicated translation from saving being a game feature to a relevant plot point? And potentially downplay the fact that while Chris might not always agree with the player, that there is something to the player's existence and abilities that is important to whatever their motives are. Especially when I'm about to discuss soon how the game's content changes depending on what slot you pick and only in the Light World, which, if Chris had that ability to begin with, that really raises more questions than I feel are worth needing to ask about what's going on with this game. Wait, really? I, I've always saved in the first one. I didn't think that there was a difference. Oh, wow. But I don't know. That's just what I think. I like all the interpretations of this. I think it'll be really cool no matter how it goes, honestly. But if we're talking on an objective level and interpreting the meta narrative proper, I feel like we'll just have to wait and see. God, I didn't think this topic alone would have so much weight to it. It's <laughs> kind of overwhelming. But oh, hey, that's ye little the extent faith. Of it. Aside from that implication, which definitely plays into the whole Chris player dynamic, we know that saving in Deltarune cannot be 100% a part of the story in the way that Undertale's saving was, and Deltarune makes a hell of an effort in differentiating how saving operates, avoiding any reference to determination in any of its save points or even when yeah. referring to the nature of souls, which throws that off the table in regards to what allows someone to be able to save in this game's universe. Yeah. There's a comparison made that because we know from Undertale that one human soul is equal to one save slot, as the Omega Flowey fight especially shows, that since there are three save slots in Deltarune, then that means that Chris has three souls in them and there's some secret third entity that is controlling them when they pull us out that's causing them to act so insane and so asylum. No, no, Andrew uh, Cunningham already talked through this, I'm not going down this rabbit hole again! But again, since we know that Deltarune has been avoiding the idea of associating souls with saving in that way, and there is a lot of emphasis placed on us being this one soul, and Chris having a lot of difficulty getting around without our soul in them, I'd say this is a bit of a reach. We yeah. know Chris exists, and we know that we exist in the form of a soul, that is all we know, and for the purpose of this series, I'm I'm just gonna stick with that to be safe, and because it just makes more sense, narratively speaking, if the emphasis is supposed to be on the dynamic between the player and the protagonist. But regardless, that's it. Aside from everything I just said, surely saving cannot be 100% diegetic. It's probably not a big deal, and the three save slots oh are no, just what there is, for the players' what's going on? because saving is not where this game is putting its focus on. And as far as I know, every save slot plays completely identically to each other. As far as you know. Each other, and there as far are absolutely as you know. no differences whatsoever between any of them. There are absolutely no differences between any of them. They're right behind me, aren't they? Okay, this. This drives me f <laughs> The differences are right behind me, aren't they? Fucking insane. I do mean what I said earlier. I can say that the gameplay is identically between these three save slots, except for this goddamn drawer. In Chapter 1, the contents of Azrael's drawer will vary between which slot you picked. From top to bottom, in the first save slot, it says it has a cross-country shirt with a tear in it. In the second slot, a very old-school photo ID with an embarrassing haircut. And in the third slot, a coupon book for pizza, of which all of them are expired. 
I even ran a little test of my own by giving myself a save file that warps me straight to Chris's room when I load it, since you can't actually save in the light world, and copying it onto the second and third slots. And loading into both of those, despite the third one being identical to the second one, I still got the appropriate items in the jar depending on what slot I loaded into. None of these items really say too much about Azrael or about any lore, and I knew of this for a good while, but it wasn't until I was making this video that I realized the implications of this one distinction made between save files, and the ability for the game to be able to monitor what slot you're in and change the contents of the game world itself depending on that, could be utterly earth-shattering for where the game could be going from here forward. Okay, so, so that could be the whole thing with like, um, uh, with, uh, with Gaster in the beginning, talking about if you have all of the save slots filled it says he says preparations are complete oh my god can you imagine later on in the game you have like some sort of puzzle the where like either choices or you have to find certain items and the items you find ha change it and, and, and like and you oh god the, the the fact that you'd have to solve puzzles or beat a boss or something in a way that would re require you changing which save slot you're in. Oh my god. One, that is terrifying. Two, for anybody that doesn't know this, because I'm pretty sure the vast majority of people who aren't data miners don't know this, because I didn't know this, how would you figure that out in real life unless they specifically told you or gave you very, like, big hints in the game? Like, massive fourth wall breaking hit. Oh god. How would that even work? Especially considering that Chapter 2's save menu allows you to save to any of the three slots at a save point and not just one at a time like in the first chapter. Already, what Gaster said about preparations being complete when all of your files were identical is starting to sound a little bit more like a hint at what we might have to do in the future regarding the save slots. This may be the best time to also mention, as this is another discovery that Hashbred Chaos made when I was talking with them, and they mentioned in their video discussing Skies Forever Blue. Since you can't actually save in the light world, I was wondering for a while what would happen if you did have the ability to save there. Well, being able to do so in the light world through a bit of tomfoolery, we can see the menu actually pop up, but with the light world's text box border, and our name doesn't show up. There is an effort made to put Chris in the name instead, which makes sense, as every time you go into the light world, your name is set to Chris and not the one you made, but it's interesting nonetheless. Even in Chapter 2, you're actually still able to save in the light world as well, to any of the three save slots at any point, but the UI did not accommodate for the smaller scale of everything in the light world in this case. Mm -hmm. But I will get to that later. Just keep it in mind for now, alright? I promise I'm not completely off my fucking rocker. <laughs> not yet. Anyway... Actually, where oh the no, fuck the were Jevil you? hat. When did I start wearing this hat? There is so much to unpack from just the save menu. I don't even know how I got here. Right, we're at literally the second room of the cliffs. Still. But hey, at least we're not doing an analysis of the lore, so a lot of the stuff that actually happens in the game itself isn't so relevant to my theory, so let's just fast forward a bit. Our next thing that Wonderful. I'd like to point out is- uh, Oh, nope, we're saving that one for a bit later too. Dear God, that is a whole other can of worms. Oh yeah, Rousey specifically calling out the Z button. Oh God. What is Rousey? <laughs> there we go. The game over screen. There isn't much to say about it other than the very notable fact that in Chapter 1 especially, this is the only other instance in the entire game aside from Gunnermaker and the pre-completion save menu where Gaster talks to you directly. He remarks that it appears you have reached an end, and asks you if you'll persist. In pretty much any other game overs after this, it cuts straight to asking you this question. If you say yes, he says that the future is in your hands. And if you say no... The world was you are met with a continued darkness? black screen as the entirety of Darkness Falls plays in the background. And that's it. Not only that, but once the song is finished playing, the game closes itself. Even on the Chapter 2 demo, it doesn't even go back to Chapter Select, it just closes itself. I always found this option so strange in Deltarune, because when you compare it to Undertale's Game Over, that screen never really had an option like this. In fact, it didn't have any options at all, it Stay just determined. brought you back to your last save point. In a game where your choices are implied to not matter, I just find it so interesting that it is the game attitude to give you a choice to just... 
give up. <laughs> Furthermore, that this is yet another instance of Gaster only speaking to you in what is essentially the outermost layers of the game. His connection to you is mostly hands-off except for these very bare-bones aspects of the game where there would otherwise be nothing meeting you. Granted, in Chapter 2, this changes. The game over screen looks more video gamey here, if that makes sense, having a unique sprite and Susie or Rousey trying to encourage you to get back up. But you can still throw in the towel, and Gaster still gives you the same message when you do so. It's just weird. But for the time being, that's my only comments on it, but it definitely felt worth mentioning. And going further into Chapter 1, there isn't really much else that I feel like I can mention within the game itself. Keeping in mind Weird that there are a lot of things that are substantial in both chapters, my priority is not to focus on the lore or what happens in-universe, but what might be poking outside of it. And when I narrow it down that much, there's poking only a few more things within it. it that really come to mind. Really? One of these is the room in between. And the yeah, loading the zone man. between the room with the first setting of the original... Starwalker, and the room with the hidden switch puzzle in <laughs> the, the Scarlet Forest, there is a random chance that, instead of going back to the first room, Chris ends up here, separated from the party, although the party's overall stats can still be found in the menu in this very empty room, save for a clearing in the middle that holds a tree. Interacting with it, you get... He is behind the tree. Walking behind it, the game tells you that there is a man here who offers you something. If you refuse, it just says that, well, fuck it, he doesn't need to be here then. But if you accept it, There's then not he a just man gives here. you an egg, and there is not a man here anymore. Not too important, not too unimportant. And while I'm here, let me talk about the music as well. The song that plays here again, is simply that called egg, I, I mean, one, that egg is weird, but again, that was one of those things I never noticed. On like, well, again, I've never actually gotten the eggs, so it was one of those things that I never noticed when like watching other people. But like, the egg stays an egg. Everything else, like your entire inventory, just turns into a ball of junk in your pocket when you head to the uh, to the light world. But the egg is still an egg. Man.ogg. And I bring this up because the song, along with the rather ominous vibe of this room in general, and being in the void, is often associated with Gaster. It's pretty of much strong the belief that it's him just giving away these eggs to you for no apparent reason. <laughs> May I and offer you an egg in this drawing time? Yeah. about what I think of this. We don't know. We can't actually confirm if this is him, and as I mentioned earlier, I only want to associate something with him if I know 100% that there is some calling card to tie back to him. Oh god, but sadly, yeah. being a little spooky doesn't really cut it for me. He's definitely not the only one in that market between these games. I mentioned the song as well, because that's one of the main defenses for this idea that the man behind the tree is Gaster. And it's possible, until you realize that Gaster has never really been referred to as a man, but just him. You would think that there is some allusion to this somewhere, perhaps similar to how the Goner Maker music was named another hymn, but that's not the case. Okay, well what about the song itself? While it does follow a similar vibe to Gaster's theme of just being the short loop of a creepy jingle on a piano, here's the thing. Gaster's motif isn't really in this? No, like, it's not at all! the fuck off. Like, maybe if your ears squinted, you could kind of hear it, but your at that point, it's squinted. such a far reach that I can't reliably be sure that this is literally Gaster that is behind the tree. They are both ominous, and perhaps they both share similar traits in the idea of there being a room in between. You could immediately attribute this to the fun events and how those worked, particularly the Mystery Man, but... Again, I, if this turns out to be, like, a continuation of Gaster with, like, a different character that will tie into, like, Toby's next game after Deltarune, I, I quit. That's just it. That's really it. I could make a really far reach and say that this is him because the Mystery Man sprite is referred to as a man, and when he disappears it makes that funny noise. Slowing it down and reversing and looping it does reveal it to be a modified Gaster's theme, but this is not the only NPC to use this noise, and it still would not get around the fact that this motif does not appear in Man.OGG. It's not even close. Like, I don't know, the best guess I could give you is that the Mystery Man might be the one that gives you the eggs because the room that he's in in Undertale definitely can have comparisons drawn. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's Gaster. I think it's possible that they are not one and the same, but their mystery man and or the man behind the tree could definitely be related to him, or at most, pieces of him. Yeah. But I am not about to sit here and tell you that this is completely foolproof. So adding the egg stuff into what we know about Gaster is a bit of a half fact really. I wouldn't rely on it at the moment. But to finally get back to the egg, you can't do anything with it other than have it make a weird sound when you're using it, and you're you able use to drop the egg. it as well, as the game just says, what egg? Which is probably not a good idea in Chapter 1, as you'll be unable to get it back in your inventory. But in <laughs> Chapter 2, when you drop the egg and go back to the Dark World, it just appears in your inventory, again, somehow. And that's the other thing about this egg. 
Aside from some weapons changing what kind of pencil or other item you have as your weapon in the light world, this is one of very few items in the game that display as their own separate item in hometown rather than as a part of the ball of junk that encompasses your dark world inventory. Furthermore, yeah. it's the only item to not change in function or description whatsoever between worlds. In the dark world, aside from what I said, it serves no purpose, although it is mentioned as a key item. In the light world, however, if you go into Asgore's flower shop and to the fridge in the back, you are able to place the egg inside of it. Inspecting it again, you see it now has two eggs instead of just the jar with the pickle. And even if you do drop the egg at any point, if you go to this fridge having done that, it will still show one egg. And inspecting it again, you'll see two eggs as well, so another instance of this egg just appearing in spite of you. What does it mean? Fuck if I know. I don't think- Okay, this is- this is it. I'm calling it now. Uh, Gaster is not a skeleton. He is in fact either an egg or a chicken monster. Anyone actually knows what this means still, and Toby has done a very good job of keeping it that way. Though I will save the other instances of this oh, egg yeah. for their appropriate segments, so for now let's just move on. Wait, are you- what? There's other items aside from the egg that appear separately from the ball of junk in the light world. In chapter 2, one of these items is the cards which represent Lancer and Rule's card, but another one of them, which you can get in both chapters in the most recent demo, happens to be what the game describes as what feels like a shard of glass, but... Well, we don't know for sure. But how do you get this item? Feels like well, a shard we'll of glass. we'll have to backtrack a little bit and talk about none what? other than the best fucked up little clown around town to ever oh, grace Jevil? all of fiction. As a similarly insane theorist once put it, I am of course referring to Jevil. This peak of existential performance is one of a few characters who I'd like to discuss in regards to Deltarune's meta-narrative as he is in a rather small but notable group of characters who know way more about how their world works than they probably should. <laughs> more particularly, at least four characters who I have in mind. As much as I would like to gush about all of them because I think they are super cool and awesome and I will give my life savings to any of these four, this is not a character analysis video so I'm going to try to single out instances where they know things that they have no business knowing and just leave it at that. And of course, I can't really talk about Jevil without talking about his Yu-Gi-Oh player in crime, Sham. Um, but I'll yeah. get to them in a moment. I'd like to start with what exactly leads to you getting this shard of glass from Jevil, and more importantly, why it's weird as hell for Jevil specifically. So to begin, you first meet Jevil in Chapter 1 after using the elevator to go to a place named with just question marks. Going down to his cell, he's excited to see the fun gang after having been alone for so long, telling his story of how he was locked up by the kings for just wanting to play a game, before claiming that in reality, he's the only free one and the king has actually built a prison around their own world, making everyone else in the Stark world the ones that are imprisoned. The statement was fact-checked by real Darkner patriots. This is true, <laughs> and do not fall for the lies of the radical Prince of the Dark. Oh god. Uh, again, I, I I don't know whether it'll be a continuous thing, but I hope that like every secret boss is just a short little confused crazy nugget of a person that is just that Gastro has just broken the mind of completely. But with an added comment about you not having any choice in the matter, as you are already playing the game, he sends you on your way to find the three pieces of the key to his cell, with Sean being the first lead. And to touch on Sham a little bit, they are the first shopkeeper that you come across in the game, who at first is just a little bit odd. They offer some insight on the state of the Dark World and how Darkners and Lightners used to live in harmony before the Knight took over and left Spade King in charge. They even allude to Jevil here, saying that the land hasn't seen this much chaos since some incident that they don't elaborate on. They display a bit of nihilism to the idea of the fun gang sealing the fountain, saying that neither light nor dark hold a future for a Darkner in their condition. We'll get back to that later, but when you first their talk condition. with them, one could just assume that it alludes to them being a bit worse for wear, perhaps past their prime. When you talk to them about Jevil, however, they're surprised to hear that you mention him, let alone that you want to free him, but they're basically just like, alright, sure, why not, it's not like it really matters in the end anyway, and that's about the extent of their interaction at that point. And once you repair the key to Jevil's cell and let yourself outside as he puts it, you see Jevil in a room resembling a carousel and, similarly to the Goner Maker, this room is almost totally foreign presentation-wise. Yeah, the carousel in the background has a sort of 3D, 3D look to it even though it's all still 2D sprites, but regardless of me with the intention to have more dimensional depth, and the background is a very trippy and warped image of an actual carousel distorting as the fight happens. Jevil, before beginning the fight, establishes that he just wants to play a numbers game before just straight up mentioning that if your HP goes to zero, then you lose. <laughs> Aside yeah, from course. one other character who might know about this, Jevil is the only character thus far to just straight up mention game elements, which is... Hmm. Yeah, we'll Very get back confusing, to that. yeah. And for the fight itself, I can't say much, but depending on whether you pacify or fight him, you get pretty interesting dialogue from both outcomes. 
When you pacify him, he says he'll sleep for the other hundred years, but that the same can't be said for the Lightners, as a nightmare will awaken in their hearts in the shadow of the knight's hand. And if you defeat him, he compliments them on their abilities before saying that there are still stronger characters to encounter, as the hand of the knight drifts forward, the queen returns, and hell's war bubbles from the depths. In the context of Chapter 1 by itself, this is all complete fucking nonsense, but with Chapter 2, obviously, we now know that this dialogue is meant to be foreshadowing is... for the main antagonist of Chapter 2, Queen. Which means that Jevil knows about Darkness from other Dark Worlds, and more specifically, he has some level of foresight to what the protagonist will experience later in the game. Actually, yeah, I think, it, yeah, because not only other uh, Dark Worlds, but other Dark Worlds that haven't technically existed yet. And that's about it for Jevil. You go back to Sham and tell them about your success with Jevil's fight, and they congratulate you on it, saying that just maybe you'll be heroes after all, but just like heroes. Jevil, they say that there's still stronger characters to face, and Jevil was just a taste of that. And their dialogue is, yet again, nihilistic, implying that your actions are futile, and that when you realize that, you can come back and toast to the end of the world. And this nihilism starts to have a bit more of an explanation once you ask them about Jevil's backstory. They go over how them and Jevil used to be friends, them being the magician and Jevil being the jester, obviously. He seemed to be just perfectly fine for a while until Sean brings up that Jevil met a strange someone that caused him to change ever since meeting them. Noting that while this could be the knight as they were also regarded as strange, the lack of any emphasis on it in red like there was for the knight's mention leaves it much more open. Yeah. Jevil started to say things that strange both made man. sense and didn't make sense either, seeing the world as a game with everyone the participants. With this obviously coming across as a delusion to everyone, Sham had to lock Jevil away, yet they mentioned that the things Jevil said stuck with them. And their view of this world has become darker, yet darker. Very, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> peculiar. So, yeah. with that very intentional wording, it's made clear that whatever it was that Jevil learned, it most likely came from this strange someone being Gaster, darker yet darker being a dead giveaway to his involvement. Quite fucking weird by itself, but with chapter 1 alone, and for the sake of saving the other fucked up little guy's story for a bit later, that's all yeah. we can really gauge. Gaster directly interacted with Jevil and by proxy Sham, and this interaction, Again, while it's big, what exactly Gaster said or did, or why Gaster was not to begin with, showed them the nature of the world that they exist like in, making him see for one, the game be short and to us. Which brings me back to the Shard of Glass. In the survey program, nothing really happens in the light world after you defeat Jevil. However, in the more recent demo, Jevil now gives not only whatever weapon or armor he would usually drop upon defeating him, but also drops a shadow crystal. Using it in this chapter's dark oh, world shows a brief glimpse crystals. of the unused classroom before rendering it unusable. And it's described as flowing like water in your hand and only being visible thanks to its sharp shadow for the crystal itself can't be actually seen. And when you go into the light world, it turns into this shard of glass. Using it yields the flavor text that Chris thought they saw through their hand for a moment. And for Chapter 1 at least, that is all that can really be said about the Shadow Crystal as it gets elaborated on a bit more in Chapter 2. In fact, we're actually pretty close to noting everything fucking weird about Chapter 1 specifically, save for some Light World stuff mainly, such as one more thing that's related to Gaster that I'm surprised I didn't mention sooner in this video. At the what very was south that? edge of oh, the bunker, you can find yeah, a of path course. To what I like to call Chekhov's bunker, or <laughs> shelter of some kind, in the clearing. You can't do anything other than interact with the locked doors, but getting closer to the bottom of this clearing, not even the doors, just closer to this bottom edge of the room, you can hear some rather unsettling noises grow in volume as if the locked doors weren't already setting this up to be very much a tease for the very end of the game. Now the thing with these noises is that if you were to take a recording of them, throw them into Audacity or something, and speed, and speed it up by, up exactly by 666%, you'll realize this is actually a very slowed down version of Smile Dead OGG, from Entry 17 and from the phone in the Dark World. And aside from yeah. the brief cutscene in Chapter 2, where it's implied Chris has talked about this bunker to some classmates as if there is something hiding in there that they have seen, this is literally all we have about the bunker. There is yeah. positively fuck all to get out of this otherwise, but we can be certain that it is absolutely related to Dark Worlds, and it's most likely related to Gaster and his experiments in Entry 17. Yeah. So, with that out of the way, that pretty much covers everything that I could possibly mention about Chapter 1. At least, in its playable state. Alright, who's up for Chapter 2? As I mentioned in the intro to the video, aside from all the weird shit that you can encounter just in the game itself, the code also has plenty to offer that I think would be worth noting. 
I mentioned that really? there are some specific files in the game that were named in a completely different manner to how they would otherwise be named. So, to explain what I mean, let me give you a bit of a lesson in game development when it comes to file naming, at least in my experience, and in the tools I've used to learn GameMaker Studio 2, which is the engine that Deltarune is made on currently. Making a game requires use currently. of many different assets and asset types. These types all pretty much are shared between engines, and you'll find they might be referred to in different- Oh god, can you imagine? Deltarune made on the Unreal Engine! ...different ways, though I could be wrong, but in GameMaker at least, I can divide these types into the following, which are most worth noting. Rooms, which are self-explanatory. Yeah, definitely. Sounds, yeah. which are also self-explanatory. It's an umbrella term for all the audio files the game uses, whether it's music or sound effects. Sprites, which are just images that are used for the game's visuals. And objects, which are self-explanatory, but to explain what they mean here... Imagine an object in game engine terms as a skeleton of sorts. It's a foundation for something that lets you use most other asset types skeleton? to execute no. a function. <laughs> They operate off of scripts that are assigned to said object or represented visually, though it is not required, as well as containing scripts and events that tell it what to do. If you take an NPC, for example, you usually associate them with the sprite that you see them as, however, the NPC is not just the sprite itself. That is just There's the thing that tells you, and stuff hey, like that. the sprite means that this is object XYZ. The object itself is the sprite that is used to represent it, and all of the dialogue, movements, and whatever other things that it is coded to do. I don't need to go too crazy into detail because I just need to talk about them in the context of file names. Usually, the general rule of thumb I've seen when it comes to naming your files in games is to use a shortened version of the asset type of the file as a prefix. So a sprite would start with SPR, a sound would be MUS or SFX maybe, a room might be like just RM or even actually room outright, and objects would be OBJ. OBJ yeah. If you were to poke around into the code of Deltarune right now, most of the files in the game go by these conventions save for a specific few. And all of these specific files that stand out do so not only for their names, but for being in all caps, and I realized pretty quickly that all of these names pretty much work as substitutes for what would otherwise be the normal file name conventions. Oh, so, no. rooms are places, any sounds are most simply just audio, sprites are images, and objects, most interestingly, have two substitutes to them. Process Device. in a few cases, but most frequently, Device. devices. Now, the choice to name the Chapter 1 demo a survey program makes even more sense to me, as it lines up a bit more with these conventions, and it's a bit less jarring as I think it honestly serves a similar function to these other file names. Adding further fuel to the idea that Gaster, in a way, in universe, might have been the one that created this program and struck a connection with the player. And once you see what these specific all caps files are for, you might start to see a bit of a common thread. So, let me start with the images. We have Image Def, which is the base image used for the background of the Goner Maker. Image Dog, which is the spread of the annoying dog sleeping used for dog check. Image <laughs> Goner Body, Goner Head, and Goner Legs, which are all the body parts that are used to make the Goner Vessel in the beginning of the game. Okay. Many, and I mean many images relating to the logo, ranging from just the logo itself to a centered version of it, which I assume might be for the chapter introductions like in Chapter 2, which is further implied with the Image Logo Center Chapter Number Files, a series of images for chapters 0 through 10 that probably display either under the logo or at least are used in the same videos. A sprite for the heart in the center of the logo, sprites for each individual letter of the logo probably used for Chapter 2's intro, a sprite for the background of the save menu, a sprite for the animated part of the background in the menu, and finally, a sprite for the specific soul that is used in the very beginning for the contact and Garner Maker sequence. Notice how every single one of these sprites are used either for Garner Maker or otherwise for very specific things that are pretty much just menus and logo stuff. For and that's the, just the outside of the Let's game see, itself. Rooms or places next. The only one of these files that's actually called a room is room initialize, which from what I can gather just seems to be a room dedicated to making sure everything is in order when you first start up the game. You probably might be in here for like not even a split second before going into the game proper, but it's just to load all the essential stuff. Okay, I okay, might be yeah. a bit off, but that is generally the gist I got from looking at the code for this room. We have place dog and place dog check 2, which are both variations of the dog check that you can get. <laughs> place contact, the goner maker sequence. Place logo, the logo animation. Place Failure, the Game Over Room, Place Menu, the Safe Select, and Place Naming Jiken, which appears to be an unused room, but from what I could gather, Jiken from Japanese can be translated into Experiment, so this is probably a room to test specifically the name selection menu. I get, I've never been one to, like, data mine games. One, I mean, like, the spoilers, and two, I mean, never really thought of doing it. Again, all this stuff that can be hidden literally right under your nose. And it all comes down to punctuation. 
fuck. Again, all of the stuff that happens if, like, you fail the game or you're starting it up, it all has to do with Gaster! And in the most recent demo as well, we have two place files for the chapter select, one that's normal and one that's scaled to twice its size. Again, all of these rooms are just menus or the Goner Maker are very specific things that have pretty much nothing to do with the actual gameplay. What else? What else? Let's see all the objects. We have two instances of an object being referred to as a process, one being for the logo animation and one for the dog check. Device Appearance handles the soul appearing in the beginning of Goner Maker. Device Choice handles all the different questions that Gaster gives you, including an unused one that lets you pick from a variety of different foods, and one that asks if you are photosensitive. Device Goner Maker okay. handles the creation of the Goner Vessel. Device Namer is for the name selection and checks for any specific names like Chris or Noel or a decent chunk of the characters in Hometown. Device Failure is for the game over screen. Device Menu is for safe selection and contains the threat variable that I mentioned a while ago. Right, yeah, I remember it. that. And Device O Back 4 is what's responsible for the appearance of the Garner Maker background using image def as a base. And the last set of files I could go over are all of the sounds that fall under these naming conventions, but this is where things get a bit more weird, perhaps reaching. I'll go over the ones really? that I found in the files first, but How does it get any lot. weirder we than this? We have Audio Darkness, which is Darkness Falls played when you decide to give up at the game over screen. Audio Defeat, which is Faint Courage. Audio Appearance, the sound that plays for the soul spawning and at the beginning of the game. Audio Drone, the droning that plays at the beginning of the game, the chapter select, and the game over for chapter one. Audio Jungle. Audio, Audio Intro Noise, which- Wait, was that serious or was that purely a joke? Which plays during the logo animation. Audio Another Hymn, which is self-explanatory. And Audio Story, which is before the story. Now, I say that this is where things get a bit more reaching because this is something that I've just noticed in general beyond the game's files, but in regards to songs specifically, the use of all caps is not reserved to the files, and some of them are displayed as such in the OST track list of both chapters. Or, that is to say, one of them is, that being another hymn. The rest are displayed in proper casing, but there's some song in the track list that do display in all caps. Aside from another hymn, both Jevil and Spamton's themes are in all caps, most of the songs relating to Spamton actually being cased as such. The Holy is in all caps as well, but the two songs that I found most weird to be in this format are Welcome to the City and Gallery. Now, the former I could probably just brush off because it's how the song name is displayed in-game as well, but Gallery is an interesting one as it only plays before the fight with Spade King and the fight with Queen. The use and meaning of the song, honestly, is worth its own video though, because I cannot tell you for the life of me why Toby decided to name it Gallery and why this song specifically is in all caps, but I thought I'd mention it because I do find it strange. But for a good chunk of these songs in the track lists, and especially all the songs that are named as audio whatever in the files, they yet again are mostly for menus, for Goner Maker, or if taking the track list names into account, they involve Jevil and Spamton, both of which we know are directly tied to Gaster in some way with very few outliers. With all of this laid out, I think it's clear that the common thread between all of these files that convinces me that these have to be named with intent and not for the hell of it is that pretty much all of them handle menus or things that are outside of the main playable game. These files are responsible for being that in-between that connects the platform you're playing Deltarune on to Deltarune's world, and they are only named as such because they handle those in-between processes. There is one exception to There's this between all these files that I just between. mentioned, but I will get to that when I talk about my findings for Chapter 2. However, I will say that in general, this is a very important reason why I believe in my theory as much as I do, and it would explain a lot of the presentational decisions made in Deltarune thus far to differentiate the light and dark worlds as much as they have been, beyond narrative or even gameplay. And I haven't even talked about that one. The one that absolutely everyone has talked about. Unused. unused there is an right. appropriately, yet intentionally named, unused function in the game's code with no arguments that changes in its contents between chapters. Regardless, its function is to name variables from unused 0 to 9 and setting those variables to their respective unused slash unused strings. These strings, when put together, form a series of sentences that appear to be coming from a currently unknown character. In Chapter 1, these yeah. strings read out as this unknown character calling out for help, for someone to hear them and not knowing where they are due to the sheer darkness, to no avail. 
While Toby has expressed in the past, mainly with Undertale, that he didn't want people spoiling the game through data mining, I think if the very clear differentiation in file naming between the menus and the core gameplay wasn't already showing that data mining was something Toby was accommodating for, this is a case where I think it shows it's just outright encouraged. Yeah. In making a file that is made with the sole purpose of not being called into the game and only being reachable through data mining that contains a character we're yet to meet and might become substantial to the narrative in the future, yeah, I can't really tell you why there'd be reason to doubt that the act of data mining and looking at the data for the game itself doesn't have any place in figuring out Deltarune's meta-narrative. Again, this is the whole thing of, uh, this was like part of the theory talking about how that's tech- that, that might be Des, Noelle's older sister, and why she just disappeared. She fell out of the world and into the code! And when taking all these findings into account, it makes some of the more bizarre things you can find in a playable game make all the more sense to me. Yet, with just one chapter, and having had all this in mind since before Chapter 2 even came out, it was hard for me to really pin down just what it was that might be playing out here. So, I never really knew what to make of it. But, of course, I spent all of this time just talking about the first chapter. Now, and I chapter the second two one is to a really thing. be sure that I was seeing some trends and that there really was something more going on behind the curtains. And I would eventually get just that. After a long and odd journey through the game's first dark world, Chris and Susie find themselves back in the unused classroom. With their bond having become less strained over the course of the chapter, Chris explores hometown before heading back to Toriel's house. And you go to bed, assuming that the demo for this strange project ends right then and there. But then you get a cut back to the room at night. Chris shuffles in bed before launching themselves out onto the ground and walking to the center of the room. They rip the soul out and throw it into the birdcage, this being far from the first time they've done so. The only thing you can do is move the soul itself pixel by pixel, unable to move outside of the cage it's been placed in. As Chris pulls out a knife and looks directly at the player with a smile, as a very clear distinction has now been established. You are not, are not Chris, Chris, and Chris is going to make decisions on their own accord if they feel they need to. Nor will they always agree with the choices you make when you're in control of them. I mean, even just ignoring all this, after the Spamton fight, I mean, if you say no, then, like, the characters, like, uh, Ralze and Susie, they notice that you sa that it sounds like it's being forced, or if you say yes, it's yelled, or it's, or actually, no, it's the other way around, if you say yes, it's forced, if you say no, it's yelled, but yeah, either way, it's like, whatever, or whoever Chris is, does, like, seep out behind our actions. It cuts to black. You then see the name of this project, this survey program. A logo fades into view with a voice reading it out. Delta Rune. And the demo ends with Don't Forget playing before the game closes itself. And that's where a good chunk of the community was left off in regards to Delta Rune. Was Chris Kara? Were Kara and Gaster fighting each other for control over the narrative? How many chapters were there going to be? What is the next Dark World even going to be like? Is some other third entity controlling Chris? Is Sansa Darkner? Why were people arguing over whether or not Ralsei was a girl? Theory crafting for this game was a bit all over the place, but you couldn't really blame Yeah, I, I remember that. that. There was only so much to work with. At least, that was until September 17th, 2021. But, I must say that this will do it for the first part of this series. Parts 2 and 3 should be coming with part 2 discussing yeah. the 2021 demo and the sweepstakes and part 3 going over the device theory proper. If you made it this far, thank you for watching, and I hope the next parts will also be interesting for you. And if you're watching this before the other parts are out and want to stay tuned for when they upload, feel free to subscribe for whenever that comes around if you so wish. It'll be much appreciated. Of course, you can drop a like and let me know what you think about what I've discussed so far. If I missed anything or misinterpreted something, I'll be more than happy to see people's comments on it, as this is absolutely no small analysis and I wouldn't be surprised if I missed out on anything important even in just the 2018 demo. For now though, that's all. Hope you enjoy the next part. Either way, catch you later gonna definitely have to see how how this plays out but that oh, i'm definitely gonna have to watch the rest of this again all this stuff i i get this kind of it calls into the whole question like with the, with the way chris moves uh, are they ripping out their own soul which we've gotten control of which kind of like 
hooks into the whole thing where we're overriding their si save file that may exist? Or is the soul like something foreign that was forced into Chris? And then, like, I guess ripping it out might be some form of shock, which is why they're acting weird. But <sighs> Deltarune is absolutely nuts. And I thought, well, I mean, a lot of the the nuts and craziness with, uh, with Undertale came from, like, after the fact. Because, like, a lot of Undertale was, Undertale was just a single self-contained sort of thing. Once you finished it, it was there. Apart from, like, the occasional updates and the, 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 the releases on other consoles and stuff like that. But you have Deltarune. And it's been just left to sit there for so long that everybody involved with it is slowly going insane from lack of new stimulus. And, I mean, granted, I mean, we haven't even heard the full theory yet. This was just going over, like, parts. Oh, I'm gonna be so excited to see the third part, and I still need to see the second part too. Oh, that's gonna be that's gonna be a deal. So yeah, of course, as always, original video and all the other parts. Of this will be linked in the description. I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.